I sure can. I sure oh, I can. Fly. Exciting. You, you do. Know, they gave you a fly, you see. Yes, I remember those days. Back when I was happy with my mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> now he has two kids, and he's like, he's too tired to even open his mouth. He's like, yeah, I get some rest. Right. Um, right. So, uh, can we put uh, Corey in the big uh, in the big thing? Over there? Bye now. Thank you all for a wonderful event, and I am peacing out. Thank you, Dotan. What a wonderful event. Other way around. There we go. Oh. There we go. Right. So just to take a moment and uh, kind of let people know how we got to the idea of this event. So uh, originally, I wanted to have a round session where people would just come up and drunkenly complain. And then Tron said, I know just the person. Uh, and then how, that's how we got you. And then we decided to make it challenging and have people have you rant on demand. That is, by the way, a new AWS service. Um, I can only imagine what the billing model must look like. <laughs> Definitely. So take it away, Corey. Sure. Thanks for having me. It's, it's always great to wind up having an evening uh, after party drunken thing at local time, 730 in the morning, which means I'm three drinks in already because I have tiny humans running around. Uh, one of them's two months old, which means that sleep is a luxury I don't get to have this year. Kind of like, you know, gathering and meeting with others and having the blissful escape of either travel, sleep or death. So. It's been an interesting year. Thank you for tolerating me. There have been a few questions, I think, that people dropped in about things people want me to rant about. But you're hosting, Gil. Dealer's choice. Where do you want me to start? Ooh, I, um, I had an idea. So you know how AWS Snowball is expensive? I want, I, I'm thinking of super gluing thumb drives to carrier pigeons instead. That could work out well. And if you think a snowball is expensive, wait till you try losing one. Because <laughs> for a long time, they said that, oh, you'll have to pay the lost device fee if you lose it, as is mentioned on our pricing website. Let me spoil it for you. There was no actual pricing information. So what it's basically saying is we're going to charge you some undetermined number. And I was very interested in finding out exactly how much that was going to cost. So I, I'm talking to people there and they have some very good counterpoints. Like, you don't, you haven't actually taken a snowball yet and you're already asking about losing one. What you doing there, buddy? <laughs> and it's like, you, you'll be happier if you don't know. And their response was, oh, undoubtedly so, but tell us anyway. Cool. So you have this service called Ground Station. And I want to take this, I want to take a snowball edge. And I then I want to harden the shit out of it. So I can, so it's basically can operate in a high radiation environment. At this point, people start to get worried with where the hell is he going with this? Then I'm going to put it in a, a launch slot on one of the rockets that go up from time to time, and we're going to orbit this thing. It's going to be the first availability zone in space. Then, and talk to it with Ground Station, and it, it becomes awesome. Then at the end of the mission, whatever that looks like, we're going to deorbit that thing onto Larry Ellison's house. Now, Done right, we're going to have a sponsor logo on the side of this thing. It's one of the only ways that you're pretty clearly going to be able to get your logo on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, you don't want to know what I'm going to charge you to do that, but, you know, dream big. And their response was, yeah, absolutely right. I was much happier not knowing that. And here we are. Hmm. Makes sense. I was actually, when you said radiation, I thought about Chernobyl. Maybe, you know, like that, that could actually work. Potentially, Fukushima is also having uh, some of those areas as well. But the problem is, is that the Fukushima reactor is in Japan, which is, you know, well run as opposed <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's been an experience. And honestly, going places that are likely to kill me just by the ambient environment is not my, uh, is not generally how I pretend, prefer to operate. I prefer they were the leading threat to my health is my own smart mouth running away from me. <laughs> that's, that's the a pandemic it's really hard though not impossible to punch me in the face over the internet okay next one so covid is almost a year old now yeah i and, really and, get and, the campaign but continue yeah but so how can we proper celebrate its birthday that's a really good question um you've got to have oracle involved somehow because of course you do. Uh, and <laughs> licensing fees are going to be a bit steep uh if other, like we, I think we really take a look at the best parts of COVID. And again, you can find a silver lining in just about anything. Like 
with you have your uh, like when you have like the the relatives you can't stand for the holiday gathering, you can turn down the speaker and then just nod sagely. I mean, those worst relatives are awful because they're they never stop talking long enough to ask a question. So as long as you can loop a smiling and nodding uh, video, you can go back and get back to your life. That's one of the that's one of the good things about it. But as, as far as how to celebrate its birthday, that's a good one. I don't actually have a great answer for that yet, but now I've got to stop thinking about it. The part of the problem here is at least in, you know, I'm in the United States, which has uh, a couple of good points to it. And then some other things too. And it's weird because depending on where you live and who you talk to, it's like, I haven't left the house since March. Uh, the hair not being in my face is all special effects known as hair ties. You know, they sell those, but other people I talk to uh, like my distant family, if they haven't died yet from this have basically been, Oh, it, it's just, it's just like the flu. Don't worry about it. And it's, if I'm the last person quarantining, I really wish someone would tell me. It's becoming a weird thing. Makes sense. You still, you at least have Amazon Prime. I do, and in fact, here in San Francisco, it's a major city, so we wind up getting a lot of the early, uh, the early access to stuff. Like uh, they do alcohol delivery, which is awesome, and they have Amazon Prime now for pets, uh, Amazon Prime Meow, and that tends to work out rather well. And it, it, it's interesting seeing the weird experiments that they launch in markets like this. It's. It's disturbing on some level where they're toying with, oh, we can wind up delivering a subset of things in two hours, but we're really sorry for that. We're trying to get it down to one hour. It, at what point is this going to be where, okay, you ordered something and we just we just have like a warehouse truck around the corner that's parked and the person running is just a big slingshot where they're going to just hurl packages through a plate glass window. And uh, basically, oh, it's in my living room. It's so nice to get something like, you know, a set of headphones instead of the usual suspects, which is a brick with a threatening note tied to it. Uh, but it's also written in the Amazon font. So one wonders. Hmm. That, uh, yeah. Hmm. Interesting point. Uh, one person here, Maish, is asking for, uh, for uh, advice on how to develop his infrastructure. He's asking um, cloud formation versus CDK versus Terraform. Cool. Now, uh, the first thing you have to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out between these things is what do I want my resume to say? Let's not kid ourselves. It's easy to say that, oh, that's a joke. No one actually does resume driven development. Yeah. How naive are you? Of course, everything we do is driven by resume driven development. My God, if you want the website to stay up in most cases for most loads, cool. I'm going to pop something at DigitalOcean or whatnot, and that'll be fine. Whereas, oh, no, 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 we need to go deep on microservices, Kubernetes, and uh, oh, I, I feel like the service mesh now as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's way easier and you have a better production outcome when you reach the senior engineer territory, which is where you realize, I want to have all these words on my resume. And I, so I need to figure out how these things architect together and speak responsibly and how I do observability. And then the senior breakthrough happens. Holy shit, I can just lie. That's right. You can lie in your resume. Those things are never fact checked. But as far as the right direction to go in between CDK, Terraform, cloud formation, yeah, there, there's a hierarchy and they're jostling for the, how do you want to manage this. But the ultimate level beyond that is what we all do, which is using the AWS console and then lying about it and saying it's done in either the CDK or Pulumi is sort of like the next tier down. Then you go back into the older, the olden days of Terraform and cloud formation, the olden, olden days of using Puppet and Chef to manage things. And then back to the beginner mind of clicking around in the console. So you can, it all comes back around again. Uh, at some point, I'm looking forward to rolling out Puppet and or Chef, not because it's the best practice, but because it's the classic retro way of provisioning infrastructure, just like grandpa used to do. Definitely. Uh, Shlomo is asking whether you should do go with Cloud9 or Cloud Shell. Depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to misuse them as a horseshit ersatz form of a database, it's hard to go wrong with either one of them. Uh, Cloud Shell was just announced. You, if on per account, once they deploy it to all regions with the limits, you get 200 gigabytes of free space per account, which is awesome. One gig each, 10 per region, 20 production commercial regions right now. So that becomes a, an awesome way of storing a bunch of crap that you really should find a better way to store. But that's OK. If you're here for good advice, this is the wrong talk. The the value of having these things is awesome. I loved Cloud9, which is awesome because they launch it as an in-browser IDE and they acquired it and they launched this and this is awesome. I 
keep forgetting it's there because for the past two years, so has Amazon. There haven't been any meaningful enhancements to it at all. And now they launched Cloud Shell this week, which is awesome. It's an in browser, in the console, there's a shell option where it spins up a free container that gives you some, an area that already is provisioned. And I, I do think the service is legitimately awesome. And I'm looking at this going, this is great, but it's also hauntingly familiar because five years and two months ago, Google released this in GCP and it was awesome. And then Azure came out with it three years ago. And then Oracle Cloud came out with it back at the beginning of this year. And holy crap, IBM Cloud, uh, the oxymoron of the year, is came out with this back in June. How IBM can beat AWS to market on something like this is just, at some point, you have to wonder if uh, like, if they're not exactly here for the hunting up in Seattle. It's, it's one of those, I, I just don't fully understand what would have caused delays like this. It almost feels like internal politicking. Now, let me be fair. I understand and accept that at AWS scale, nothing is simple. All of this stuff is hard. All of this stuff is complicated. And I am sympathetic to that on balance. I pay them a shitload of money, as does pretty much everyone. And that money is not just for them to solve the easy fun problems. It, I understand it's hard. I'm paying you. Do it anyway. Not to sound like too much of a jerk, but yeah, I have expertise. <laughs> Which brings me to another point. Uh, so a while ago, I wrote a script and it didn't work. So, yes, and I had yes, yes, I too work with computers. <laughs> and, and then I had an epiphany. Why do cloud sure. automation, instead of hiring a click form to drag and drop stuff on the AWS console? Because you're not thinking hard enough on this. The right way to do it is people like, sure, you're, I can hire a click farm to just click things randomly. That's great. And, but it's, it's, the, it's the small brain thing. The right thing to do is if you want a service configured, what you do is you build an IAM role. So it's, it allows you to configure this thing in a test account. And then you build a, a user account, an IAM that has access to that role. And that's all it has access to. And you accidentally post the credentials for that role on GitHub. And then you wait. Because as people discover this, they will break into your account and configure the service for you. And ideally, find a way to make it mine Bitcoin, because that's basically the ultimate, the only reason people hack into things anymore, apparently. And, and by the end of it, you just capture what they've done. And, oh, that's how that service gets configured. Awesome. Then you copy that into your production account, and you're set to go. <laughs> Robert Barron asks, what has the cloud ever done for us anyway? It, it's about lightening the load. It's about taking burdens that you have and not having to carry them anymore. For example, in a time before cloud, remember how heavy our wallets were? We don't have those problems anymore. It's about being able to throw things over the wall to someone else. And again, I'm okay with that in some respect, but the thing that always pisses me off is the data breach announcements where some big company says, oh, some terrible vendor that we used uh, wound, up, uh, wound up exposing your data and getting breached. It's like, Cool. Who hired that vendor, asshole? It's it, you can outsource work. You can't outsource responsibility. You own your own uptime, regardless. And a lot of people like to say, "Oh, the cloud went down. That's awful. That's why you should always remain on data centers." Yeah, I used to run data centers. They went down a lot more than the cloud did, and it wasn't because I was crappy at my job. That was just an ancillary aspect. It was the honest fact is that you're not going to be you're not going to be better at running data center, data centers than these giant providers are. They're computers. They're terrible little things, and they hate us. So having someone who is better at wrangling those things and has more budget than you do to do that, spoiler, all the hyperscalers have more budget than you do to run these farms unless you're basically Facebook. But enough about terrible companies no one likes. What else can I answer? <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Julia asked, why is everything on AWS elastic? And uh, no, and no, and this is one of those and this is one of those that. questions. Mm -hmm. This is one of those questions that I'm really sorry that we have a code of conduct. Oh, <laughs> it's not elastic. Just say it's elastic because, like, oh, that's the value proposition of cloud. So that when you get a whole bunch of traffic, you can scale up your environment. 
and that and, and and meet that surge, which is true, and it's great. And then at the end of it, you can scale it back down, which no one actually ever does. It's when they talk about elastic volume size resizing. Yeah, that's up, not down. And in fairness, when you talk about scaling volumes down, an awful lot of file systems just melt themselves to bits when you try and make the volume smaller online, which, okay, cool. I get that. But auto scaling groups, they scale up and they give you the capacity you need 20 minutes after you needed it. And scaling up and pre-provisioning is important. So people do it, but they don't go the other direction because if I don't scale up, I'm dropping traffic and now TCP terminates on the floor. If I fail to scale down, then, well, my only real failure mode is that I just spend a little bit of extra money. And let's not kid ourselves here. It's not our money. It's our employer's money. Uh, that joke used to land a lot better with me until I owned my own company. And then it was, oh, wait, that's just my other pocket. Never mind. Uh, Julia complains that you did not answer her question. Ah, okay. Why is everything elastic was the question that I heard. Um, because naming is hard. And that's why AWS just gave up on it years ago. Uh, do they use the same excuse for their billing method? Uh, their billing method, no. Uh, that's not elast that's not elasticity. And again, bad names aren't going to let you overcharge customers. So what instead they do with billing is, you know what this thing needs? More complexity. That's right. The, the problem is, is you need to be able to look at a service and figure out, okay, if someone has this much traffic, how much should it, should they be able to, should they be charged at the end of the month for this? And if you can come up with an answer, you haven't succeeded yet. And it has to be a the, the suck it and see method, which is not as profane as it sounds. Back in the days of data centers, that was how you would find out if a power cable was live. Uh, suck on the end of it. And if you're blown backwards through a rack, it winds up basic. It, like, okay, that's how you learn by doing the painful thing and living through the experience. I'm kidding. We, we didn't actually do that in data centers. That is super dangerous. We had an apprentice do it instead. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, Moshe Ben Shom asks about the uh, new AWS service names, specifically AWS Systems Manager Application Manager. Or Systems Manager Change Manager or Systems Manager Fleet Manager to join Systems Manager Session Manager. You have all of these different manager services reporting up to Systems Manager, which has not been promoted to Systems Director because it's clearly basically a woman in tech at this point. But yeah, it's a terrible naming scheme of something manager, something manager, because apparently they haven't hired a systems manager marketing manager who would actually name things well. It's the, This is the problem, is that systems manager as a service is awesome. I love the service. It offers a lot of really neat things, and it's gaining additional functionality. And the problem is, is that they, they look at what they have built, and they saw that it was good. And they're like, all right. Now, do I really ruin everyone's day with this? Because the service is so good, there has to be something awful about it. Yo, AWS namers, what can you do for me? And it's great. And it's, uh, hang on, I need to go walk my dog again. And it's, wait, wait, what the hell did you name the dog? And you really don't want the answer to that question. It, it winds up being something like Simple Elastic Bark and Floof 2.0 for containers. Hmm. Uh, Maisha asks, why do you only rant about AWS? Why no love for Azure, GCP, AliCloud, IBM? Oh, uh, honestly, because I, I enjoy ranting at uh, about things that actually have paying customers. It, <laughs> when I, and my day job is I fix horrifying AWS bills. And I went where the big bills are. And for a long time now, it's one of those, hey, while you're looking at, I don't know, our $20 million annual AWS bill, can you also fix our GCP bill? Cool. How much is it? Oh, about 50 grand. Yeah. Uh, how about we fix? Like, I can I can wind up saving you that much money on your load balancing portion of your AWS bill. This is a radical concept for some, but why don't we start with the big numbers and work our way down? And when we get to GCP, we'll have that conversation then. Same story with Azure. Now, this is not a global truth. It it is very much the customers that I deal with and the circles in which I run. AWS also, for some godforsaken reason, had a five year uncontested head start in the time of cloud. So a lot of the small companies that were experimenting with this in two thousand eight or so are now the giant companies and have those presences there. Uh, Cloud migrations are kind of a myth in some respect. They're an incredible amount of work with unclear gains. So if you are building out on AWS and Amazon has pissed me off for a reason and there's, oh, there's 6,000 good reasons you can pick for that. It doesn't matter which one. We're going to move off of them. 
Well, that's 18 months of work in most cases, and it's expensive engineering work. And you have to learn the ins and outs of a new, different platform. What's the business outcome at the end of that? And if the answer is, I don't know, seems like a good idea to me. It, yeah, just because Amazon has pissed you off is not a sufficient reason to do that in most cases. So the idea that, oh, I'm going to pick a bunch of cloud agnostic technologies that are not tied to any particular provider so I can move it anywhere if I want to makes you feel way better about never doing exactly that. So what have you gained? Hmm. Pretty much nothing. Uh, and I see this uh, coming up all the time. Uh, Alex asks, uh, can we say running on bare metal is cool yet? Sure, because at this point, it's hipster. It's one of those, oh, yeah, I know what the data center looks like. It's it's one of those areas where every once in a while, back in the before times, when I would give a talk on stage, I would work a slide of rack nuts, the things that you would use to mount servers into racks. And we've all bled for them because they cut your hands and hurts like hell. And then I just, I'm very careful when I change that slide to watch the audience and sort of measure the proportion of people who have the flinch reaction of, ah, because they remember and it hurts. <laughs> Block it out. I'm told childbirth is somewhat similar, except when you see the rack nuts, it comes crashing back in a whole different way. <laughs> and that proportion of the audience has been getting smaller as time goes on. I, either people are learning to control their flinch reflex, unlikely, or there's an increasing constituency of folks who have not worked in data centers. This is, from my perspective, a very good thing where I like seeing people who are new to the industry getting into these things. I like throwing gates open and bringing people in, like, come work on cloud, be miserable with us. It's great. <laughs> and it's it's one of those, like, I feel like at some point I'm trying to convince people to try drugs just once, just just see how you like it. It Yeah, it's, uh, the problem is, is that, that's not a really fair comparison because if I'm trying to get people hooked on drugs, I'm presumably making a profit. Here, I'm just spreading misery around. Al, uh, Alex asked about uh, career development. Uh, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, management isn't a promotion, neither is moving to another company. Uh, management is absolutely not a promotion. It's an orthogonal role. That is the honest truth of it. The counterpoint is, yeah, look around most companies and see who makes more, the manager or the engineers. And well, why is that? Uh, some people think there's a hierarchy. Personally, I think that it's because dealing with people's shit is a lot harder than dealing with computers in some ways. Because here's the thing. I can run the same thing through a computer repeatedly and get deterministic output unless it's running an Intel chip. Whereas I can, with people... What works on you doesn't work on someone else. And everyone's different. And even at different weeks, people have different reactions to it. And it can be maddening. And it's a completely different skill set. Now, so the honest thing is not when you look at your career, it's, well, I need to show progression. Companies that know what they're doing offer a technical contributor path that doesn't require managing people. You have to be very honest with yourself of what are you going for here? Is this about your own development as a as a person and what you want to be doing. Life is long and our careers are long too. And I think that it's, I don't want to spend that long time miserable in ways that don't appeal to me. I'd rather have, find forms of misery that do. I, for example, don't particularly enjoy managing people at the moment because there are aspects of it I really like, but it's also maddening in different ways. So I mostly wind up uh, passing that stuff off to my business partner. He manages the staff. I basically go and make a fool of myself and then use like this as a primary job. That's right. Find something you're good at and enjoy, in my case, shit posting, and find a way to build a job out of that. And sometimes the path to do what those things you want to do absolutely is about, uh, about, pro about uh, management. Sometimes it's not. The second half of that question is about changing jobs. Is that changing companies? Is that a promotion? Maybe, maybe not. It should definitely be a raise, and it's something that people should do way too often. What you don't want to do is look at the last 10 years of your career and find that you have one year of experience you repeated 10 times, unless that's what you're going for, in which case, fine. I'm not one to judge, but it would drive me nuts. So I like finding new and exciting ways to learn new things and keep moving forward. If I were still having the same problems of, that I was having 10 years ago, like, how do I get the blood to stop flowing when I just cut myself to pieces on the rack nuts? I, I would be super depressed and also heavily calloused by this point. So it's it comes down to what is the problem you're trying to solve for? For me, it's always been about finding new challenges and exactly how far can I go to pissing large companies off before they either kill me or send me a cease and desist? We're hmm. still trying to find the boundaries of that. <laughs> uh, we only have time for one more. 
and I saved this one for last, Corey. Okay. Only because I really, really love you. Excellent. Uh, why is cloud billing so hard? Because if you knew what it was going to cost in advance, no one would pay it. It's it, in all seriousness. I when I first started this, it's one of these. Why is this billing system so awful? And then I made some friends. Well, friends is kind of a lofty term for people who barely tolerate me. But I got to know some people who work on the billing system at at these environments, and I talked to them about the constraints that they labor under and how this works. The billing the billing system at AWS, and they've been public about this in blog posts, takes in over a petabyte of raw data per day. It is monstrously large and complicated. And rendering that down in a repeatable fashion is hard. It's super hard because it turns out that the world is full of people like me, you know, assholes. And when you are, if there's a, if there's a edge case for me to get free services and exploit that, that's a problem. They have to capture the dimension that I will be exploiting. When it was in beta, S3 did not charge per request, just for storage. Cool. So you wound up with a bunch of people like me, again, assholes, who would build these uh, enormous arrays of zero byte objects and use the metadata uh, to actually store the things they cared about. <laughs> the big key value store. That's right. They made it a database. Misusing things as databases is kind of my entire shtick. And like, oh, yeah. How do we prevent that? Because at some point, it's, it incurs a sizable cost for which they are capturing zero dollars. And it's the answer is cool. We're going to charge, I think, what is it, a penny for every thousand requests or something like that. So for most common use cases, if you have any sizable storage at all, that's sort of a who cares story. There are some very weird, very broken use cases where that really can hit you and evaluate if maybe you're not using the tool properly or the wrong tool. But there's a whole bunch of stories like that. And... Every time I ask the question of why is this billing aspect so wonky, the answer has never once been, holy shit, we never thought of that. The answer is always, it's complicated. Do you have a whiteboard handy? Let me explain the constraints here. And every time I come away smarter and honestly a little bit more uh, respectful toward what the internals of the billing system, I have a lot of sympathy for it, but consumption-based pricing as a thing is not predictable, full stop. Now you can do, you, there are ways around that. You can do modeling, you can do standard deviation calculations to figure out what is the likelihood. You can do scenario modeling as well, but there is no provable way in advance to figure out what something is going to cost when you're paying for consumption. <laughs> and then cool. a bunch of shit running forever by accident doesn't help either. <laughs> I did that once. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's still running today. I'll turn this thing, I'll turn this instance off in a week. And meanwhile, you're going to retire before that thing does. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, I, we would like to announce the, the three, our three favorite questions. Excellent. Uh, 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 first, uh, the one year birthday of COVID. That's Natalie Pistonovich. That was a good question. I wish I had a better answer. Yeah. Uh, the second one is uh, Moshe Ben Shalom with AWS naming and mm. how that is difficult. But that's a classic. It's kind of a giveaway. On the other hand, it was good. I don't know. And the third one, uh, and my personal favorite, Why is Everything Elastic by Julia? And mostly because it spawned, uh, it spawned several non safe for work threads that go on in the background. Excellent. Excellent. Good, good, good. <laughs> so, Corey, uh, we are. Uh, so happy to have you again, over As you and over again. Delightful, Gil. <laughs> I love you, man. You just keep ignoring me on Twitter. Exactly. Oh, I blocked <laughs> you years ago. Are you kidding? <laughs> Cheryl, no, can you yeah, just here while I go cry in the corner? Yeah, it's yours. Just thank you. <laughs> for me. If you enjoy my Corey, novel. the one and only, the one and only Corey. Thank you so <laughs> much for. <laughs> I cracked up the whole time. I'm shilling here just a second. If you're enjoying, if you're enjoying my nonsense, please check me out at lastweekinaws.com where oh. somehow probably I get paid what? to make fun of Amazon for a living. <laughs> uh, one thing I would like to say is while Corey keeps it fun and funny, there are a lot of jewels of wisdom in the things that he says that he like kind of sews in there because he doesn't want to be taken too seriously. But dude has wisdom. Dude has wisdom. So we're yep. very impressed for, uh, my, for some of my other nonsense as well. Like someone was asking, I just noticed, like, why are there the wrong number of candles on the menorah? And it's uh, the, there's the honest answer of freaking goyim uh, designers. But the honest answer, <laughs> is, candles or not enough candles? If it's not enough. The answer is I got it at a discount. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's too many candles, redundancy. 
<laughs> I, 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 like those, I like those deep answers. They have all that knowledge, and it's almost as deep as, you know, as, as the pockets of people who work for AWS. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's, a, it's a two pizza teams and at least we like to assume at least one of those pizzas might be kosher <laughs> i think that's the perfect way to wrap this up thank you so much Corey, for being here and joining the community me. again oh, the community misses you and hopefully you'll be able to join us in tel aviv again sometime next year in tel aviv yeah. how it goes um, amen 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 um and i think this is it i think uh gil we are wrapping it up. We are uh, thanking everyone for joining this super duper awesome packed day of excellent talks and keynotes and spotlights and ignites and so many things. Uh, we hope that uh, our next events will be face to face and we can meet up with our community friends again. But uh, until then, um, this is what we got. We have our meetup groups, so you can follow those. There's DevOps Israel, Cloud Native, StatsCraft, and DevRel IL. Um, and uh, in, in regards with the swag packs uh, that people had asked, so they are going to be at us, at our organizers' houses. This is what we do. This is what we can do in a pandemic. They're not anything too fancy, but they're something memorable from the event. Uh, we're going to be locking down the swag pack, swag shop in like a couple hours, a couple or maybe a day or so, um, and then we'll pack those up and we'll get those uh um, to our organizers and you can come pick them up. So we will send you an email. If you registered for one, if you ordered one, you'll uh, be able to come pick one up. Thank you so much, Gil, for hosting oh, the last oh, session so wonderfully. It was so great. Um, and really to our MCs and everyone and all the organizing team behind the scene and our sponsors, we hope you had a wonderful time. Community Summit Tel Aviv out. This is it. Thank you so much, everyone. Peace out, and I am Sorry. going to wait.